Some of the trickiest positions in chess are when you have a bunch of pawns in the center and you're not sure how to resolve that tension. You could capture this way, you could capture this way, you could push by, or you could just leave those pawns alone and do something else, right? If you make the wrong choice in these positions, a lot of times it's gonna lead to a worse position for you. So in this video, I'm gonna give you 10 concepts that you can think about that will help you make the right choice. And real quick before we start, a huge thank you to my new patrons, Tim, Jason, Jay, Jacob, and Nathan. Really appreciate you guys. And now let's get to the video. All right, concept number one is actually more important than anything else on this list. Okay, this one trumps everything else, so pay close attention. But concept number one is that always be on the lookout for tactical tricks, okay? So let me give you an example. King's Gambit starts like this, and Black can play the Falk Bear Counter Gambit, D5. And all of a sudden, on move two, we have a lot of central tension between these pawns. We can capture this way, we can capture this way, we can push by, or we can just do something else. And there's actually a well-known trap here, but if you take this way, you immediately are losing because the queen comes out, check, and if you try to block it, check again, and you're losing your rook now to this fork. And the only other thing you could do instead of blocking would be to move your king up, which is absolutely terrible, and you're probably gonna get mated in the next couple of moves. So um, this is absolutely like the worst move that you could possibly play. Now, capturing this way is not as big of a deal because the queen can come here, you can just block with the pawn, and there's no trick here uh, forking your king and rook because the pawn is still here blocking the queen, okay? so. This is an example of a tactical idea that's that's there in the position. And if you miss that, it doesn't matter what you calculated. It doesn't matter what you were thinking about with these pawns and the pawn structure that maybe would arise or anything else. It doesn't matter because you fell for that trick. So always remember, even though there's lots of tension between pawns, there are other pieces on the board that you really have to pay attention to. And here's one more quick example. Black has just played e5, and white is contemplating playing rook e1, maybe queen c2. They're, they don't really want to mess with the pawn tension, so they, they decide to play rook e1. Huge blunder, because the pawn just moves forward, and we lose a piece. Now we're getting forked. Okay, so even though there's tension between the pawns, you don't want to forget about all the other pieces that are around and in the game, right? Usually, these types of mistakes are, are the reason that a lot of people lose games, not really anything to do with the pawn tension it's that they get distracted by the pawn tension and something like this happens and they lose a piece okay so always be on the lookout for tactical tricks where pieces are going to be hanging or something is is going to happen and uh because if, if that exists it like i said before it trumps everything else okay so keep that in mind all right concept number two that you want to be thinking about is are you going to be freeing up your opponent's pieces by the decision that you make. So let's take a real basic example here. This is the French defense, e6 and d5. And one way that you could approach the French defense is to just simply trade. This is called the exchange variation. And th there's nothing, let's just say, wrong with this, but it does make Black's life very easy because immediately you have opened up this bishop and now Black can choose to put it here, to put it here, to put it here. Uh, they have no problems developing their pieces. This is just completely equal position, right? But if we go back, you could have also maybe played the advanced variation where you push. And now black has to deal with this bishop for the next at least several moves. It's going to be pretty difficult to develop that bishop unless they want to put it on d7. There's not really anywhere else for it to go. Another option is you don't have to push, but you can play a different line. Maybe knight c3 or knight d2 is another line where you're leaving the tension here and you're not opening up that bishop for your opponent okay so that's something that you always want to be thinking about in these types of positions particularly if your opponent is kind of cramped and you have a little bit more space a lot of times trading off pawns like that will open up the position for your opponent so in those cases a lot of times it's either good to do nothing or sometimes pushing by is a, is a smart choice all right concept number three is that you want to think about which files are going to be potentially open or your rooks or your opponent's rooks. So in this position, um, the thing that, first of all, there's a lot of tension there. Right? There's two pawns, two pawns. So you have two different captures. You could also push by, or you could kind of just leave it and, and do something else. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to these two rooks. Okay, remember this, this principle is about paying attention to open files for your rooks. So how could we play a move that opens the file for these rooks? Well, we could capture the pawn. And then if black recaptures, this is now an open file. 
Okay, remember open file just means there's no pawns on it, right? And we have the double rook, so even though black gets some control because they do have a rook there, this is much better for us because we have two rooks, okay? So that's totally a move that I would play. And if you're wondering, if they tried to capture with the knight, then it allows us to play c4, the knight has to move, then we can play d5, it opens up the bishop, uh, puts lots of pressure on the center, and most likely this is still gonna get open and be good for our rooks. So to recap, whenever you're thinking about which way to capture or should you capture, you wanna ask yourself, well, is it gonna benefit my rooks if I capture one way or another. If these rooks happen to be on the D file, well then I might be more considering capturing this way because it's gonna open up my rooks here. Okay, so always be on the lookout for rooks and as well as your, your opponent's rooks also. All right, concept number four that you wanna think about is does either player have a king that's still in the center? So in this case, black has already castled and has a rook in the center. We have not castled, our king is still in the center. So very basic question here, but do you think it would be smart for us to take this pawn? Well, the answer is absolutely not, because if we take it, then black can recapture. And look at that. We've just unleashed a rook onto our king for no reason, right? We didn't have to do that. It makes no sense to do that. So if you're in a position like that, where your king's in the center, you absolutely do not want to trade. Pushing by makes a lot of sense. Or even just leaving it, right? Even just leaving it because this pawn uh, on e6 is still going to be here blocking the rook, right? So either of those two options would be fine. I would absolutely not take, though, okay? So think about the king. Now, if... Uh, it was switched and we were castled and our opponent's king was in the center and we had a rook sitting here, well then yeah, I would absolutely want to take and, and try to get that file open for the rook. All right, the next concept you want to ask yourself is who has more knights or more bishops in the position? So I've got a silly little example here where I still have the French defense, e4, d4, e65, but I've just traded off black's bishops for our knights. So uh, one thing that you probably have heard about bishops is that they're better in open positions. So since we have the bishop pair and our opponent has the knight, what move do you think I should play in this position? Well, the answer is capture because I want the position to be more open so that there's more diagonals that my bishops can have access to. Closing off the position like this is something that's going to benefit the knights because the knights don't really care if it's all blocked up. They can hop around, you know, and jump over the pawns very easily, whereas my bishops are going to be hindered. Okay. Now, if we compare that to this position, same exact position, except I've switched it. Now I have the knights and my opponent has the bishops. Well, of course, the best move now is going to be to do this keep the center as closed as much as I can, restrict my opponent's bishops, and my knights can hop around and do whatever they need to do. So you want to be thinking about, you know, do you have more knights or more bishops in a particular position? And then maybe that's a clue as to like, should I lock up the position or should I potentially open it up? All right, the next concept you want to think about is gaining space. And a lot of times you can push by instead of capturing or allowing the tension. And when you push by, you can gain some space. So again, we've seen it a few times already, but the French, um, one of the lines you can play is called the advanced variation. And what this does for white is immediately gives you a lot of space. So when I say space, what I'm talking about are, see how all of these squares are open for my pieces? If I want to bring this knight here or here, I can do it but without a problem. If I want to bring the bishop here or here, I can do it. If I want to bring the bishop here or here, I can do it. Black, on the other hand, doesn't have the luxury of that. The knight can't go here. The bishop can't go here. You know, there's only really one square for these guys to go to. This bishop's kind of blocked. So they have to really maneuver their pieces around and it's just very cramped. So this is an advantage and it's in a lot of other positions as well. If you push by, usually you gain some space and that could be uh, an advantage. Now that does come with some weaknesses, which we'll talk more about a little bit later. But generally speaking, something you wanna keep in mind. All right, the next concept you wanna think about is what is the resulting pawn structure going to look like after you resolve the tension and depending on how you resolve the tension. So uh, let me give you just a quick example here. This is the modern defense. So bishop g7, uh, knight c3, and there's this one line at c5. And black is obviously creating some tension here. Now, if we decide, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and take it. Black has the option now to capture here and we take. And we get these <laughs> tripled pawns, very uh, ugly looking pawns. And the reason tripled pawns are so bad is because this pawn can't move because this one's in the way. This one can't move because this one's in the way. They can't defend each other. They're kind of just like sitting ducks and just targets, right? Boom, boom, boom. Okay, now, that being said, it's not all bad news for us. We do have the bishop pair. Uh, Black did create some, some serious weaknesses on the king side here, so it kind of balances out. But the point, the point is that before you make this capture, you have to ask yourself, do I, am I okay, you know, playing this position, and do I like... Am I willing to play with triple pawns, 
And if the answer is no, well, then you don't want to do that. You want to consider maybe a move like E3, right? If you really care about your pawn structure, that would be a better move. Um, D5 also could be played, but you do have, you know, this pawn structure here, which is also maybe not good as well. So you have to think through that. Another pawn structure that you want to be aware of is what's called the isolated D pawn. And so just a real quick example, we'll go back to the French here. Let's just say I did play the exchange French, and then there's a line where you can play C4. I can't remember the name of this, but... Um, basically you know you're you're trying to put pressure on the pawn this way well black has the option that they can just take it and when they do that you now have this isolated d pawn and you know this can be a target for black right because there's no pawns that can defend it and eventually black can play knight c6 maybe this rook can come over at some point bishop potentially it could become a target now it's not all bad news because you know you do have a pawn in the center that is controlling some central squares and sometimes it works out nicely for white but again you have to think through this if you're going to play a move like c4 or from black's perspective you know this might be something that i think through like you know what i think i do want to take this because i want to create that isolated pawn and then i want to go and attack it and that's going to be my my game plan later on in the game that's that's a viable strategy right so think through that and I'll give you one more pawn structure example. This one's a little bit more advanced, but it comes out of the Queen's Gambit, and this is just the Queen's Gambit declined. And it, let's just say knight c3, knight f6. If you trade these pawns, um, a lot of times, let's say knight f3, c6, bishop g5, bishop b7, e3, castles, uh, bishop g3. Okay, you get a position like this. And the pawn structure is interesting in that white has these two pawns over here, and then black has all these four connected. Well, this actually gives you the opportunity to play what is called the minority attack. And the way the minority attack works is you're going to push these pawns down like this. And your goal is going to be to try to trade this one for this one. So, for example, let's say I played, um, let's box turn. Let's just say a three because I want to set up b4. I don't know. Black's just going to do some random stuff over here. I'm going to put my rook on b1. We'll say they maneuver the knight here. A4, bishop b6, b5. Okay, black plays, I don't know, rook c8, and I take. Okay, this, this, this is a successful minority attack. Obviously, I, I didn't really try to stop it by black, but um, I've traded off the pawn, and this is now a backward pawn. Okay, it's backward because it can't really advance um, without, there's no support from adjacent pawns. And so this is a good target for me now. I can castle and line up my rooks here and potentially try to win this pawn on c6. Okay, all that, right, started way, way back all the way back at the beginning when we had this tension and I decided, you know what, I'm going to trade it off, right? And we got this, this pawn structure. So that's kind of a more advanced example, but you want to be thinking through the resulting pawn structure, even as, as early as this. And how does that, how could that play out down the road? All right. The next concept to keep in mind is that it's easier to attack on the flank when the center is closed. So let me give you an example, and this time we're going to look at it from Black's perspective, but it's going to be the French again, okay? So the French defense advanced variation, the, the whole point here that Black usually does is, is try to attack the d4 square. So c5, and White tries to defend it. We try to keep attacking it. White defends it. We keep attacking it. And now there's this move, bishop d3, and we can't actually take it, even though it looks like one, two, three, uh, and only two defenders. If we take it, this is kind of a well-known trap. Takes, 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 takes. At the end of everything... White has this discovered attack on our queen with check, right? So they put us in check. We have to do something about the check and we lose our queen, okay? So uh, we can't actually take it. And there's, you know, a move that might pop into some people's minds. What about c4? And the problem with this move, even though it looks like, oh, it's kind of cool, we're attacking the bishop, the bishop has to move, is after the bishop moves, we have nothing happening now as black, right? Before we had a lot of pressure on the d4 square, we had some threats that white had to be careful for. Now we have nothing. Like we're, not, we're never going to take this with these, with these pieces unless we're willing to just sacrifice a piece, right? And white, on the other hand, has exactly what they would like to do. So a lot of times in these positions, white likes to attack on the king side. Their pawn chain is aimed in that direction. Usually you want to attack in the direction of your pawn chain. Bishops are lined up that direction. And it's very easy for white to do that and not have to worry about anything happening in the center. If we back up a couple moves right here, now white always has to pay attention because we might capture here, right? Even if we're not winning a pawn, we might capture just to kind of open up things. Now our bishop can come in, or maybe our knight can come in, or our queen can come over. We have lots of things we can do. Once we push, um, there's no more anything for black here. Okay, the only thing, I mean, we can eventually push these pawns down and try to make something happen, but it's probably not going to work out well for us. And 
that's something that you want to keep in mind when you're in these positions and you've got some tension and you're thinking about pushing past, okay? All right, the next concept's a bit more advanced, but you have to realize that whenever you push a pawn forward, you're giving up control of some, some squares, and sometimes those can be used against you. So let me give you an example from a, uh, an opening that this guy used to play with at college. He was an international master, and he always used to play this opening against me, and I really had a tough time with it. So let me explain. Uh, I would play e4, and this guy would play g6, bishop g7, and then he would play c6, okay? And I would do something normal like knight f3, and he'd play d5. And I always would push by and I would think, you know, this looks pretty good for me because I've blunted the bishop here and I've gained a bunch of space, right? Well, the issue with this move, if there is an issue, uh, is that it gives up control of this square right here, f5, okay? And what this guy would do against me would play h5, I would do something. He'd play knight h6, I would do something else, I don't know, bishop g5. And he would just sink his knight in here on f5. And this knight is so annoying. Like, even if I were to go bishop d3 and try to take it, then the bishop comes, and there's a bishop. And because I've pushed this pawn forward, I can't attack it that way. And because this pawn's on h5, I can't play g4. Even if I tried to play h3 and g4, I can't even do that, because he just takes it, and then at the end of that, my rook is hanging, right? So basically, this knight just sits there all game, putting pressure on d4, being annoying, and... It all happened because I decided to push by on e5, right? If I didn't do that, go back here, you know, the pawn maybe would still be there. Now, of course, they could have taken it and then it's just gone, but that's a kind of a different position. But this is the point, right? Whenever you push, you are giving up control of some squares and you have to be careful and think through that. And I'm not saying that this is a bad move. You should never play it. I'm just saying, be aware that, hey, there's a hole here now that, you know, pieces can go to. All right, the last concept is that sometimes it can be advantageous to leave your pawns in the center and keep some central pawns. So, you know, talk, thinking about the example that I just talked about, how, you know, when you push by, you create holes, right? Uh, let me give you another example. So let's say e4, c6, d4, d5. There's one line, I think it's called the fantasy variation, where you play f3. And basically what you're trying to do is say, oh, you want to take my pawn? Okay, that's fine. I'll recapture it. And I still have pawns in the center. Real quick, another example, this is like in the London, d4, d5, bishop, f4, uh, you know, whenever black plays c5, usually you play c3. And the idea is that like, okay, go ahead, take me. I'll just take back with the pawn. And I just keep my pawn on d4, right? Same idea here. You keep your pawn on e4. So this is a good trick to remember uh, that, you know, when somebody attacks a pawn in the center, if you'd like to keep your, your central pawns, you can do it by pushing one of these side ones, either f3 or c3. Now, that being said, there's an important thing that you really have to pay attention to here, okay? So listen carefully. When you play f3, yes, you are giving the pawn a defender, and that's nice. If they capture you, you can recapture and you get control of That's cool. But they don't have to capture you. And if they don't capture you, you've taken away probably the best square for your knight, okay? Knights do very well on these two squares, right? If it's black, it's f6 and c6, white, it's f3 and c3. And when you put a pawn there, your knight's not going there right away, okay? Same thing over here. If we go back to uh, the London here, if I back up a couple moves, uh, they don't have to take you and your knight can no longer go to c3. Now on the London, it's not a big deal. Usually your knight's going here anyway. But if you are gonna go with this kind of a strategy, you have to keep that in mind and you're most likely your knight's gonna have to go here if they don't take you, or it's just gonna have to wait, right? So keep that in mind, and and maybe, you know, if you're playing, um, let's say, black in this position, that's something that you wanna think about. Like, do I wanna capture and allow my opponent to get their knight on that good square? Pro probably not. Now, you, it's certainly playable, um, but these are the things you wanna think about. All right, guys, well, those are 10 concepts you can keep in mind when you have pawn tension in the center. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you check out this one where I talk about how to blockade pawns and the importance of that. You do not want to miss that one. But as always, thanks for watching. Stay sharp, play smart, take care.